quick introduction on him. So Jeffrey, partner at the Magic Partner at Monitor Deloitte, he has over 30 years of experience in uh, management consulting, advising clients um, in the upstream, midstream, downstream, you name it. Uh, international clients from China, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan. So he's very wealthy expertise of knowledge here. And, uh, <laughs> Not wealthy this, no, just, no, just no, for no, clarity. No, no, no. Very, That's right, right, right. Our rates are very low. So. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to point out is Jeffrey does put out a weekly blog and a weekly podcast. So for those of you who read the description um, for the event, um, it is digitaloilandgas.com, and he does put a uh, podcast as well that's available on iTunes, so he will touch on that uh, when we get started. But without further ado, here's uh, Jeffrey. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do respond well to applause. Uh, Bitcoin also works. So if you have Bitcoin, <laughs> just throw it in my direction. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, the joke quality goes up uh, with the, uh, the more Bitcoin that you throw at me. Uh, and thank you very much for extending to me the invitation to address you. Um, I was curious because I didn't think there were young professionals in energy. I thought they all looked like me. And uh, so what I'm really delighted is the fact that there's actually young people interested in the energy industry. Uh, I've never seen the industry uh, facing such a tidal wave of change. And the industry will not survive unless an audience like this room gets agitated, excited, and invested and committed in helping to improve the industry. Uh, how many of you have an electric car? Okay. I don't. So there's the story. It's coming. We all can see it coming, but it ain't here yet. There's still demand for the hydrocarbons uh, that we produce. There's absolutely ways to make the hydrocarbons cleaner. A lot of that is digitally driven, um, by the way. And uh, so what I'm going to walk you through tonight is the results of a um, conversation that I was invited to um, as a result of writing my weekly article series on the impact of digital on oil and gas. Uh, the International Energy Agency, which is based in Paris, uh, 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 reads my stuff. They don't pay for it, by the way, which I, I find kind of offensive, but uh, it's not behind a paywall and there's no advertising, so it's free, but they read it. And they called me and they said, we're conducting a um, working session in Paris. Uh, we need someone who can actually bridge the divide between the oil and gas industry and the digital industry. Would you want to come over and spend a couple of days with us? And I said, no, not really. Why would Paris in the spring? Why would you do that? Yeah. So my wife said, no, no, no. Paris in the spring, can't beat that, let's go. So we booked tickets, went to Paris, and I spent two uh, rather exciting days with the International Energy Agency. Now those of you who don't know who they are, they are the preeminent forecasting um, body uh, that provides guidance to its membership, which is the OECD economies and other economies around the world around the, the pr profile of supply and demand of energy and the impact of, of changes in energy mix is having on national economies. So if you're sitting in the Middle East, this is a big, you watch what these guys publish very, very carefully because what the IEA uh, pr forecasts around the demand for energy has a big effect on, uh, on uh, these uh, various economies. So I was invited to participate in this and what I'm going to walk you through tonight is the results of the workshops that we held. Uh, much of this is information that's not in the public domain until I tell you. Uh, I can't tell you who was there at the meetings, and I can't tell you who said what. Those are what's called Chatham House rules. But I can tell you that the kinds of companies who were in the workshops would be companies who are really big into things like cloud computing. Or they were very large automotive companies or manufacturers. Or perhaps they were really, really big power utilities or they were agencies that were really concerned about security. Names like NATO might come to mind. I'm not suggesting that they were there, but NATO might have been there. <laughs> and uh, so the conversation was all around things like, what is the impact that digital is gonna have on energy? And the reason why this is a big concern is because uh, three things uh, have been bothering the Europeans. Not as much for us, but they're certainly bothering the Europeans. Number one, Uber came out of nowhere, still causing violence and disruption in big European cities who don't understand 
uh, the effect that the digital is having on the transportation sector. Number two um, was the cyber problems. There's been a, a rash of attacks, not all of them make the media, but then there's a rash of attacks of state actors who penetrate and hack into energy infrastructure, like power utilities, take them over, and then shut down the energy infrastructure in European countries in the middle of winter. Okay, this is a big issue, big concern. And third, the IEA was looking at digital technologies and saying, we think, well, we have this carbon issue. We're not going to hit the, car, the uh, two degree uh, target, by the way. That was something they told us at the session. They said, we're not going to make it. Um, but digital might be able to extend our runway a little bit. We can see clean tech coming and reduction in demand of, um, for molecules and electrons. How can digital make a difference uh, to the energy mix globally? Okay, big questions. So what I'm going to share with you, therefore, is what's going on with the supply of energy? How does digital affect the supply of energy? How does it affect the demand for energy? How does the intersection of digital actually pull together gas, oil, and electricity in ways that's never happened before? Right? Cross-cutting issues because they're now integrated. And then finally, what um, advice would um, companies uh, be uh, taking on board to be able to cope with, um, with uh, th this wave of change? We got into who's going to win and who's going to lose. Yeah, yeah. We didn't get into names, didn't name companies, but we absolutely got into which kinds of industries and sectors were going to win and which ones were going to lose. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're just starting out your career, i.e. if you're a young professional in energy, wouldn't you like to know who's going to win and who's going to lose in the energy transitions? Yeah, yeah. So you can either pay attention um, and uh, take lots of notes, or you can ask me to give you the slides, which I will do, including the speaker notes, which are very rich, have all of my fact base in them. I'll just hand them to you, okay? As a gesture of my generosity, plus the fact that you might find it of uh, a value in your career, and you may hire me at some point in your lives to help you sort through some of the issues that your companies might be facing. Sound good? Sound like a fun evening? Okay, now we only have six hours, so uh, <laughs> I'm hoping we'll get done before then. Um, in terms of Q&A, Seymour, what was our plan? You could raise your hand at any point and we can do a bit of a deep dive or... And then wait till the end? Perfect. All right, that's what we'll do. Okay, <clears throat> impact of digital. This is the first, I love this slide because you know what's not on this slide? Phone numbers. You can't phone me. I don't give out a phone number. If you want to reach me, and if you want to reach people at your generation, you give out your Instagram account ID, you give out your, your WeChat ID, you give out your Twitter account, you give out your LinkedIn profile, you say, here's where you can find me on Facebook, but for Christ's sake, don't phone me. Okay? No phone numbers. So this is how you can reach me if you want. As uh, Seymour mentioned, you can track me down on Digital Oil and Gas, so there's the Twitter account and the blog site. Uh, there are 75 odd articles on the site at the moment. Uh, covering virtually everything from strategically how do you think about this uh, digital transition uh, to how does um, a uh, blockchain work. There's 15 articles alone just on blockchain because it's going to have such a profound effect. Uh, this week's article was on um, artificial intelligence app applied to oil and gas. Where does it make a difference? Uh, last week was uh, what happens when you put blockchain on a car. You might think, well, why on earth would you do that? Well, Porsche has already done it. Uh, so Porsche is going to be rolling out blockchain on their cars and this is going to have an effect on people who sell oil because the demand for the oil at the petroleum station is going, now going to start being driven by how cars make uh, planning or plan their petroleum consumption pattern. This is a quite a profound shift. We all think of, oh, well, I'll go buy fuel based on what's printed up on that big sign outside the gas station. No, you're not. Down the road, your car is going to make the decision for you. Now, that's, that's at the sort of the retailing consumption end. The same logic applies to companies who are in the fracking business, who are in water hauling, who haul sand, who, who manufacture pipe or make equipment for oil and gas. The wave of digital change is going to affect all of these industries, not all uniformly, but the effect will be no less profound. I don't even own a Porsche. Anybody here have a Porsche? Would you admit that you own a Porsche? Has anybody rented one? My mom has 
Your mom has a Porsche. Panera, like the four-door? Boxster. Boxster, ooh, <laughs> the nice one. So the, uh, the Porsche is the front end to Volkswagen's brand, right? So what they do is they experiment on Porsche because those people can afford it, and then they roll it out into the Volkswagen brand. And Volkswagen is the world's largest car manufacturer. So if Porsche is doing it, it's coming to Volkswagen. If it's coming to Volkswagen, Toyota's not far behind. There's only six automotive manufacturers in the world uh, account for 50% of auto sales. So all it takes is for a small number of them to get their act together, and boom, this gets rolled out across the petroleum consumption side of industry. All right, supply, demand, supply, cross-cutting effects, and then finally, um, policy advice. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to rely on my notes, and I, I, normally I memorize these sorts of things, but um, the facts are really fascinating, so I'm going to refer to some of them at times just to kind of uh, 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 give you the uh, sort, of, sort of specifics. Um, but let's turn to demand. So what's driving all of this is this thing called uh, Moore's Law, which was um, uh, print, uh, first coined by Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel years ago, who discovered this funny phenomenon that every 18 months, the density of circuits on a chip and the cost of those chips, the density doubled every 18 months and the cost uh, fell by half every 18 months. And uh, th that exponent, those chipsets, same chips, are showing up now in uh, watches. That's an Apple watch. For those of you who have an Apple watch, you'll, you'll uh, know how powerful these things are. That has the same computing horsepower as a Cray supercomputer uh, from the mid-1990s. Okay, so I'm walking around with 1990s supercomputer technology better than what could get you to the moon on my wrist. And I use it to look at Mickey Mouse, okay? <laughs> toy store, a toy story. Any of you have a smartphone in your pocket? Yeah? You're carrying a supercomputer in your pocket. And if all you do is use it to look at Facebook, and by the way, a lot of oil and gas people, that's what they use it for, you're really, really undermining, uh, not, not taking full advantage of the technology. Um, the amount of internet traffic is unbelievably, um, uh, is showing unbelievable growth. In 1987, the total internet traffic in a month was one terabyte. In a month. Okay? We now move that kind of data, <coughs> or I should say, orders of magnitude of that kind of data every second at this stage. It's in the zettabytes uh, range, which um, is 10 to the 21, 10 to the power of of 21 per day. It's scheduled to grow by um, a factor of five over the next five years. Okay, so it's not stopping, it's actually growing. And the reason it's growing is because you can take that smartphone technology and you can pop it onto a pump or a truck or a car, all of the other stuff that's wandering around out in our society, not yet wandering, but when it does, it's gonna use that kind of sensor technology. And that's gonna drive enormous volumes of data traffic. Next is the data explosion. IBM estimates that fully 90% of the world's total recorded data was recorded in the last 24 months, okay? Most of it, pictures of cats. <laughs> you have a cat, you've done this, right? How many of you are guilty of taking a picture of a cat and putting it on, yeah. So yeah, a lot of pictures of cats. Um, the amount of YouTube video uploaded, HD video, every second is 400 hours. Okay, 400 hours every second. So the amount of data that's moving around now is, is, uh, is, is not, not only has that grown, but grown very dramatically, it's also going to continue to grow. It's not going to stop. Uh, if you fly an aircraft um, today, you record as much data on a single Boeing um, aircraft flight um, as would fill um, hundreds of CDs. You'd have to chop down something in the range of 50,000 trees, turn them all into paper, and then print them double-sided front and back to capture the same amount of data that you get on a single airplane flight. Okay? What is going on with Uber when all those cars are driving around, capturing all that data? So if, we, if we're doing this with aircraft, we're going to be doing it with cars. If we do it with cars, we'll do it with trucks, with trains. So data explosion is, is, uh, is uh, relentless. Next is the number of internet users. There are something in the range of three and a half billion internet users in the world today. We're not yet even at the crossing like the 50% mark. There's more people with smartphones in sub-Saharan Africa than have electricity. It's more important to have a smartphone or a mobile phone in Africa now <clears throat> than to have uh, electricity. 
So the, the, uh, the number of users uh, with in-home internet is certainly north of 50%. Broadband is certainly north of 50%. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> last one, the connected internet devices. That's my, my Porsche and my car, but it's also my jacket might have a uh, computer on it. Uh, we've done experiments. My firm has done experiments in Australia where we take a hard hat. We put a little computer in the hard hat with a little camera uh, lens and some uh, measurement devices. Uh, all of those devices now become things on the internet. And so the volume of those is expected to grow as well very, very dramatically. Like 8 billion devices today to 24, 25 billion by the early 2020s. Okay? Enormous volume of growth. Uh, and of course, you put all those devices on the internet and they drive data and they drive communications. Okay? Um, top six biggest companies in the world when I was your age would have been oil and gas companies by market cap. Who are the top six biggest companies in the world today by market cap? Anybody hazard a guess? Apple. 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 Amazon. Oh, we're going to do them in, in alphabetical order Amazon, <laughs> Apple. Microsoft. Uh, there's two in front of it. Google, G, yeah, we missed the F one. Facebook, yep, Microsoft, and Alibaba, Tencent. Yeah, the two Chinese companies. They're the biggest companies in the world now by market cap. Only Facebook is in the top 10 companies in the world by revenue. Okay? The biggest revenue companies in the world, if you went to run the top 10 list, two of them would be oil companies. So oil and gas companies account for a lot of the revenue, but the money is all headed over to these, uh, these digital giants. Let's turn to transportation. I remember where we're going to go through here is what is the demand for energy? So the biggest, there are three big sources of demand for energy. Okay, three big sources. Number one, which I want to talk about, is transportation because it has um, some of the it's the, the part of the industry that's going to change the fastest will be the uh, transportation sector. It's about 28% of total energy demand. Now, by total energy demand, I mean if you took every power plant, every um, ounce of oil and gas that you've sold, every joule of natural gas, every electron you ever produced in a nuclear plant, if you added it all up, 28% of that total pile goes to transportation. This is why the transportation industry is attracting so much interest in automated vehicles, connected cars, electrified transportation, shared vehicles. It's because that is a huge, huge number. Say 28%. Also, these assets turn over really quickly, right? You can get a new car every six, seven years. So we can transition the transportation fleet actually relatively quickly. There's a lot of views out there that'll take a really long time, and, and, and will to turn over all of the old junkers out there, but um, the, the, tr the tr fleet itself can turn over quite, quite fast. The market for automated transportation technology by the mid 2020s will be north of $200 billion. And that's going to be chipsets, uh, blockchain in cars, uh, automated driving technologies, um, all of that stuff. That's going to be an enormous, enormous market. It has nothing to do with us here in Alberta, sadly, because we don't make any uh, automated transportation. But our problem as, a, as an economy is that we sell the product that is being displaced by this um, wave of investment. Okay? That's the big issue for Alberta. As that train keeps trucking down the line to, to replace um, internal combustion engines with electrified transportation, to replace Robert here driving at this, the wheel with a robot that controls the car, well, we, we bring those cars closer together, and as your generation shares cars, my generation is not used to that idea. That'll be my grandparents. You'll be looking back years from now going, my grandparents used to buy their cars. <laughs> like, what were they thinking? We'll all be in shared cars. We'll all be sharing cars. That wave of change, which is entirely digitally enabled, by the way, connected cars, shared cars, that is displacing the demand for fossil fuels in the combustion engines of cars, trucks, and trains, and so forth. We don't know how to do it yet in aircraft, but that's coming. Okay? That's why the province is pressing it down so hard on diversification of its energy mix because of this uh, major wave. There's two schools of thought, though, around how, what the effect will be. On the one hand, some studies say we will have a 90% reduction in the demand for transportation fuel. And other studies say we will have a 300% increase in the demand for energy in um, transportation systems. 
Now, why, do, why would there be such an opposing view? I mean, you can't see a range any wider than that, plus 300%, minus 90%. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Would be based on fuel efficiency? Yes, efficiency of engines is a big driver. Uh, how fast will this generation just agree to share cars? My, I have two kids, uh, 23, 25. They have neither driver's licenses nor cars. They don't understand why you would even have that. Um, so uh, how fast will this generation adopt and drive more efficient engine technologies? How quickly will we permit automated cars on the road and robots, which are going to be much safer than us? How quickly will we uh, uh, allow for these uh, shared uh, vehicles? Imagine a community of 100 people. And um, rather than each of you having a house where you have a garage with a car in it, you agree to pool your car investment as a community. How many cars could you get away with that everybody could fully satisfy their entire car consumption demand if I just pooled cars? How few could you get away with? It's said that New York City could run um, on just a few thousand vehicles, a whole city, all the transportation. My car sits in my garage 97% of the time unused. So if I had 100 cars, 100 houses, this, basically this room, we could probably get by, probably get by with seven cars if we shared them. Imagine putting them on blockchain so every time you went and took the car out, it recorded your usage and you paid for that and, and, and you brought the car back. The cars looked after themselves and fueled themselves up. Science fiction? Ernst & Young has built the app. Okay? Old people like me can't wait for this because I don't want to drive anymore. <laughs> you had your hand up. Yeah, you can already see this in action in Amsterdam and places like highly populated. Highly populated communities, rental bikes, and so forth. Uh, those of you who are really interested, if uh, something not here in the presentation, this is, this is probably the place to take a note. Look up WIM, W-H-I-M. It's an app built in Helsinki, Finnish, all you can eat mobility in Helsinki for one low, low price. All you can eat. All the Uber, all the taxi, all the rental bikes, all the public transportation, all of the shared cars, all of the everything you could possibly want in the in Helsinki area for 90 euros a month. Right? That is the price that most Europeans will pay for insurance for their car. Now you can just get an app where you can just mix and match whatever transportation uh, service you want. Why, that technology is absolutely, it's gone to Amsterdam, so I'm glad you mentioned it, but it's uh, uh, definitely the sort of technology that will take over uh, transportation demand in large economies. Next big demand for energy is buildings. We're in one. Three biggest energy sinks in the building here, lighting, lighting, air conditioning to keep us cool, and heat to keep us warm. Okay, those are the three big demands. 55% of global electricity demand alone goes into running these kinds of buildings. And the lights are left on overnight, and uh, the air conditioning runs when there's no one in the room. You walk into the room, the air conditioning is not synchronized with the lighting, so the lights come on, but the air, the air con doesn't come on. The air con will come on, but the lights will stay off. None of this stuff's integrated and connected up. Digital opportunity. Digital opportunity. That's where this kind of technology is going to make the biggest difference in moderating uh, energy demand in buildings. The wave of technology coming into smart appliances um, in, down the road is uh, enormous. Now, Alberta is not an appliance manufacturing province. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't make appliances here. But uh, this is absolutely coming. Um, everything that you can imagine uh, in, in, in your household, the five big appliances in your house for energy consumption, anybody know what they are? What are your five big ones? Stove, stove, cooktop, fridge. Washer, dryer, dryer particularly, yeah. Dishwasher, especially if it's on heat cycle, right? And number five is oven, oven, actually. Because many, many, you can actually separate the cooktop from the oven and watch the electricity consumption differently. Um, those five appliances uh, drive an enormous amount of energy consumption. If we can pu pull those down, Europe, for instance, if they move all the appliance into the smart appliance range, can eliminate an enormous amount of unnecessary incremental investment in energy infrastructure because the appliances can buy power when they're smarter when, rather than when they're, it's most expensive. 50% savings coming in smart thermostats alone. So Apple's Nest product. Why is Apple into Nest and all of these other smart home? Because that's the reason why. It's a huge energy um, opportunity. Uh, the day will come when your house will, not unlike your Porsche, 
will go, oh, what's the cheapest electrical supply right now? Oh, well, I'm going to buy green power today because it's low. Um, and I'm going to, oh, is the price of energy going to spike in the next 20 minutes for some reason? I'm going to turn down my refrigerator. I'm going to make sure it stays off. That kind of technology can help us manage the demand for electricity in a big way. And that's the kind of change that the uh, in, uh, manufacturers are aiming to achieve in energy efficiency technologies. Um, then smart lighting, if you just improve lighting, 20 to 25% um, energy savings. Just changing light bulbs and changing fixtures and so forth to make them smarter, to know when there's people in the room and you, the lights only come on when someone's present. Third big sink, industry. Industry, that's the manufacturing, uh, warehousing, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, chemical industry, the oil and gas industry. Fully 38% of global energy demand goes into making things. And uh, history has shown that there was a wave of change that went through uh, industry many years ago, probably before. Anybody here predate the 80s? Be born before the 80s? Yes, you, you and I have the distinction. So back in the 80s, <laughs> It's hard to believe this, but most manufacturing plants did not have process control equipment and SCADA systems. There were people, usually men, who walked around on the shop floor with clipboards, earmuffs on, hard hat, taking notes of what all the gauges were. And then they'd go back and report that into some central room where a bunch of guys with slide rules would try and figure out how the plant was running. In the 80s, in order to improve the efficiency of manufacturing, we went through this enormous wave to implement SCADA technologies, process control, and industrial automation into factories in the 80s. In the 80s. There was, I met somebody here who worked in process control. Uh, which of you guys I was talking to? <coughs> I was talking to you, one of you earlier said you work in um, emis emissions control. Which, which one of you was that? Ah, uh, there you go, yeah. Detection, yeah. Hmm. And how many of you work for companies that either have SCADA systems or uh, use data from SCADA systems or work in a company that actually has SCADA systems? Just about everybody. Here's the thing, little tip. We're leaving this industry, which means the people who knew how to roll out this kind of technology into these plants are retiring, okay? The next wave of change and a great opportunity for young professionals in energy is to figure out how do I roll this kind of digital technology into these plants, into these plants. There's going to be enormous demand for that know-how because the size of the prize is so big. It's certainly less than two years uh, payback for virtually any uh, digital investment. That was the payback when SCADA systems went in. It was less than two-year payback. That's in energy savings, process control, safety, and, and so forth. Big sleeper technology, 3D printing. It's absolutely nowhere in Alberta today. We, people still view it as a toy. The, the slowest 3D printer 10 years ago cost $18,000. That was the slowest. The slowest 3D printer today costs $400, and it's 100 times faster. Okay? That's an exponential shift. The fall in cost and the dramatic expansion in capability. 3D printing will transform how manufacturing moves stuff around. Nike, there are some really great studies if you go online. Read up on Nike who tried to calculate how much carbon is in a running shoe. <clears throat> Every one of you with running shoes? Everybody with running shoes? Who's got running shoes on? Anybody? Yeah. How much carbon is in a running shoe? Three pounds per shoe. Per shoe. Yeah, we make the cotton. We grow the cotton in India, right? But we dye it in Pakistan. So we have to ship it up to Pakistan. Now we've got a dyed bolt of cloth for my running shoe. But I, where do I cut it? Oh, well, I'm going to send that off to Bangladesh, because that's where the cutters are the best. Now I've got to make my shoelaces. Where am I going to do that? Oh, well, the plastic eyelet that comes on the, on the tip of the, my shoelace, I'm going to get that in Taiwan. And the shoe string itself, I'm going to manufacture in Shenzhen, just outside of, of um, uh, Hong Kong. <clears throat> the actual shoe design, I'm going to do in California. But the bottoms and the machines that are going to actually build the, uh, the, the, the shoe um, bottom, I'm going to buy those machines in Germany. And I'm going to do the manufacturing um, in uh, some place in southwest, uh, southern, uh, Southeast Asia. I'm now going to ship all of these things around and assembly them in the United States for market. That creates three pounds of carbon per shoe. Per shoe. 
So the manufacturing industry who consumes a lot of our hydrocarbons are staring very hard at how do they make your shoes three pounds lighter. And one of the ways to do it is 3D printing. 3D printing. This field is going to grow like mad down the road. Not so much in Alberta, but certainly outside. And its effect will be to remove the demand for oil and gas because we're not going to be shipping things around so much. Okay? Watch this space, 3D printing. Um, a good example of where um, uh, investment in digital um, smarts, um, what kind of prize is out there. Uh, styrene manufacturers, this goes back a few years, but they built a digital version of their styrene manufacturing facility, which means they built a model of the styrene plant in the cloud. And then they ran the model in the cloud and uh, discovered that they were able to save 30% um, out of the processing time for running their plant by better modeling of it in the cloud. Okay? How much digital modeling could we do in Alberta to improve the productivity of our assets here? Oil sands plants, tank farms, wind farms, gas plants. The utilization rate of industrial equipment down the road will go from mid 80s on average into the high 90s, into the high 90s. No one wants to spend any more money on building these plants. What they want to do is extract every ounce of productivity out of them by applying digital to how the plant runs so that they can extract more cycles. To do that takes younger minds than mine. Because our generation is in that older way of doing things. Okay? There's never been a more exciting time to be in this industry, in my, in my view, for reasons like this, this wave of change. You can look at this and be very gloomy, or you can go, hang on a second, there's huge opportunity here. Huge opportunity. Now, what does this mean for oil and gas? Three vectors. Take these three vectors away. They're not quite clear on the slide, but I'll just tell you what they are. Number one, if you apply digital to oil and gas in the upstream, you expand reserves. Better understanding of fracking. Better understanding of yields and uh, yield curves. The IEA estimates that artificial intelligence and smart thinking applied to the upstream will grow reserves globally by 520 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Sounds like a lot. It's only 5% of the current known global reserves. But if you believe in the Paris Climate Accord and the two degree target, we can't burn that. And by the way, where is all that oil and gas? The United States. It's in the US partially because Canada is a bit too slow to adopt some of these technologies, but also because the U.S. is blessed with geology, you have to read geology. So 520 billion barrels of oil reserve growth. What happens when you raise the supply of anything, all things being equal? What happens to the price? Goes down. Why are the Saudis so interested in getting their, their uh, stock um, that float for, for Saudi Aramco? Why are they doing that? Partially to change the economy, sure, but Another big driver is they're going to be sitting on the largest pile of the cheapest resource and there may be no demand for it. Okay? So, digital grows reserves, supply goes up. Now, we've talked a little bit about electrical cars and transportation change. What is happening to the demand for petroleum on the, on the transportation side and the energy side? Where's it going? Up or down? Hard to say. Hard to say. Transportation looks like down. People are planning for down. So we've got supply going up, we've got digital pressing down on demand. What's going to happen to price? Right? Back to your, your economics 101. This is going to permanently shift the supply and demand curves and permanently lower the price. That's a way to think about this. I might be wrong. I'm not an economist. But that's what it looks like. So what does an oil and gas company have to do, or any, any company have to do, when the demand for your product is going down, the supply of your product globally is going up, and you're sitting on a very expensive version of it, we have very expensive oil here in Alberta, what do we have to do? We have to bring digital technology and thinking to the cost and productivity equation of this province. That's what we have to do. And we have to do it a lot faster than we are today. A lot faster. McKinsey estimates, for instance, that it takes, if, uh, if you're in the telecommunications industry and you came up with uh, Darnell, Darnell invents a creative, great new telecom technology. How many years does it take for Darnell's invention in telecommunications to achieve 50% global market penetration? How many years? Wild guess. Five years. 
How long to do the same thing in oil and gas? 50% market penetration. 30. 30 years. That's your lifetime. You could invent today and be dead. Because yeah. you're not going uh, to see value from it. No penny. So where is the value going to come in uh, as we expand uh, impacts on oil and gas? As I mentioned, it's going to be in the tight oil and gas plays, the shale plays, the tight sands in the United States principally. Although Canada is blessed with very strong resource capabilities, certainly in the uh, BC area. But as you all know, we're having real problems trying to get it to market. Okay. Now we also have a potential to reduce our production costs here in Alberta by at anywhere between 10 and 20%. We barely scratched the surface on cost reduction in oil and gas. Some of the conventional players in Alberta, I um, probably can't name names, so I'm not sure how much I can share, but certainly the conventional players, not the oil sands players, but the conventional players have lifting costs and full net back, uh, their net back costs uh, models are as close to Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Iran as you can possibly get. So $15 a barrel. Some companies here in Alberta are making as much money today, if not more, at today's price with the netbacks we're achieving because of pipeline and market capacity re restrictions as we ever made when the price of oil was $100 a barrel. Yeah, shocking, but it's true. And we're just scratching the surface around what digital can actually do. So the wave, the emphasis of uh, impact here is very, very high. Critical tools that are going to do this, artificial intelligence will be a very, very big driver. Um, I have, uh, I've already presented once to COSIA on the impact of AI, and we've got another meeting coming up uh, later this week um, as the industry says, where does this make money? How does this apply to us? Now, there's lots of barriers, right? Lots of barriers. Oil and gas in Alberta in particular, we love to get the silver medal. No one wants to be first. Don't be first, be second. We need more courage in the province. More people willing to experiment, more people willing to try. And what I really love about the province at the moment is all the entrepreneurialism I'm seeing in Nucleus and Rocket Space Next Door here and ATBX and uh, Creative Destruction Labs and so forth. That's what we need. We need more of that. More of that. Other barriers. Uh, we, look at, uh, we look at a reserve and we say, well, it's going to take me 40 years to produce this reserve, but I cannot see the demand 40 years out. How do I sanction a 40-year oil and gas development project if I can no longer see a 40-year timeline to recover. That's a big barrier for boards now. Big barrier. It's kind of going, Ugh, I don't want to strand my capital. So the capital is going into smaller plays. Uh, drilling sites in the US, for instance, that are shales, where it's just $10 million, not $5 billion, like we're used to spending. Okay, That's why that's happening. We can no longer see the, the forward horizon, and it's compelling us to go smaller and shorter as fast as time to recover as possible. So there's lots of barriers. Lots of barriers. But as I look at it, lots of opportunity. Plenty of opportunity. Impacts on power. For the first time ever, um, for the first time ever, certainly in 100 years, electrons are going to go in two directions. OK? They're going to go in two directions. I'm going to have a battery in my house. And I may sell my power outbound from my house to my neighbor. That's never happened before. I am going to, be, I'm going to become a power generator. I don't have systems for that. Like, how, how is that going to work? If I, if I have a battery in my car, in my Porsche, and the price of electricity is spiking, and my car is sitting in the garage, and I've, I, he, he, it knows I'm not going anywhere, it could wheel that power out into the grid like that, and I could make some money. I could make some money. I am going to become a power generator for the first time ever. This has never happened before as a society. We've never done this. So the electrical model design that we've all grown up with, we generate it in big power plants, we transmit it over long distances, and we distribute it into people's houses, and we flick the light switch, that model is dead. It is dead. We have to completely reconfigure, rethink, and rebuild the entire electrical infrastructure. Hmm, hadn't thought about that. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to do that at the same time as I'm adding all of these crazy electrical cars. Like, think about it. If you're an electricity planner today, and you look at you know, some, some developer's plan for some community, I'm going to put in a bunch of houses here, you can pretty precisely predict how much electrical demand you need to supply to that community, right? 
everybody's got a fridge, everybody's got a stove, you can model it all out and go, all right, I gotta supply so much megawatts to the neighbor. What happens when we all have electric cars? The demand of electricity for my electric car, if I own one, is the equivalent to my entire household. But it's on wheels. I'm gonna power it over here, I'm gonna power it over here, I'm gonna power it over there. My whole planning model for how I think about electricity provisioning doesn't work anymore. And by the way, the top six automotive manufacturers, who are, another sort of, this is like pub quiz, right? Who are the top six biggest automotive makers in the world? Who are 50% of the automotive supply? Volkswagen? General Motors, yep. Ford, yep. Toyota? Nope, not in the top six. So, Nissan, another Japanese and a Korean outfit by the name of Hyundai. Okay, there's your top six. That's 50% of all automotive sales. Every single one of those companies has announced they are aggressively pursuing the transition of internal combustion engines to electrified transportation. By 2020, 2025, you guys will not be buying gas-powered cars. And Transalta won't know how to supply you with electricity. You laugh, but I think that's true. I think that's true. I'm gonna put solar panels on my roof. I'm gonna become a power generator. I don't have the systems to do that. I don't know how to sell it. I don't know how to buy it. I, I don't know. But we all have the opportunity to do that. That's coming. It's coming, it's coming really quickly. Really quickly. Power utilities, probably the biggest hidden opportunity is participating in the energy transition for the power sector. Things that they will gain, of course, uh, is this reduction in unplanned outages. The outage uh, is the, um, the equipment that runs uh, energy infrastructure gets smarter and smarter and better. It will no longer be subjected to as many as uh, unplanned interruptions as we typically see. So it's gonna get much better. The assets will last a lot longer, which means we don't have to spend as much building these assets, which is a big difference. Um, there's a huge efficiency gains, which, uh, which we pointed out, coming out from, from electrical infrastructure, stoves and so forth. Anybody here have an induction cooktop? I have an induction cooktop? Yeah, like it? Won't go, Won't go back, exactly. Once you've had induction, you don't go back. You don't go back. I've had gas, electric, coil, induction. I rented a place here in Sunnyside, condominium, and uh, went into the kitchen and went, whoa, vintage, 1970s. Uh, so I called the landlord and said, I need an induction cooktop. And he's like, I'm not doing that. And I said, tell you what, we'll go 50-50 on it. And I'll give it to you when I'm done. Because of the energy efficiency savings, the time savings, it's that good, that good. So the newer technologies are that good, okay? Efficiency opportunities. Main problem with power, no incentive. Like the traditional investors in power, shareholders and so forth, don't have their, the incentive structure is not there. So that's our biggest issue there. Here's the total system effects. Mentioned there's some cross-cutting issues. The whole supply and demand curve now is starting to blur, right? If you have a gas business, do you sell your molecules to produce electricity? Or are you gonna sell them into methanol to manufacture methanol? Or are you gonna sell them to Suncor to generate power for a SAG-D? Or are you gonna turn them into, uh, in your own home turbine, turn them into electrons and put them into your battery and store it for a rainy day? Uh, the whole, this, these, have, these have been traditionally independent value chains, like they didn't have, ever intersect. Now they're intersecting and intermixing. That's a big shift. Um, we talked about the rise of the prosumer. So this is the producer-consumer. That's me. I produce and I consume. This is a big difference in business models. Power flow is going two directions. Houses, buildings, energy, a lot smarter, a lot more technology flowing around. Um, EV charging, Porsche plugs your Porsche into Germany, but when you drive across the border into France, different privacy rules. How are you gonna pay for that? Do you wanna use the same application to surrender your credit card data from this jurisdiction to this jurisdiction? That's why Porsche is looking at blockchain. They can, using blockchain, they can say, well, if I'm in France, I'll give this much information, but if I'm in Germany, I'll give this much information. Okay, protection of privacy. Uh, and then small-scale distributed power. Think about it, TransAlta today Anybody here from Transalta before I get to? Uh, <laughs> anybody here from a power utility of any kind? <laughs> Which one? NMAX. NMAX. Oh, I'll be very nice to NMAX. 
I think we audit NMAX, so I have to be nice to NMAX. But Transalta. Transalta today cites really large gas plants. What happens when I say, well, I'm going to put solar panels on my house, or we're going to put solar panels on these buildings up here, right? Their business model, which is I just have to buy this big plot of land and drop a big plant on it, eh, it doesn't work anymore. All of a sudden, the power is all out there. Huge business shifts upcoming for the power utilities. How do they survive in this world? This world is not without its risks. There was a fish feeder installed in Las Vegas. Anybody ever go to Las Vegas? Yeah? You see some of those big casinos and they have these big oceans like with coral reefs and all this stuff in it? Well, guess what? They don't have a guy or a gal there who feeds the fish every day. So what they do is they put in an automated fish feeder. It's got a little sensor in it. It can tell how, much, uh, how many fish are in the feeder and how much food it has to drop in. And it was connected to the internet and the company was managing it and a dozen other similar aquariums all around Las Vegas. Someone hacked into the fish feeder and began siphoning off all of the confidential information that was swinging around inside the casino. This is what's called a phishing attack. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Your laugh is wrong kind of phishing. True story, true story. Another outfit here in Alberta put a smart, um, uh, smart um, microwave oven in the employee staff room, one of the gas plants. The uh, appliance had a Wi-Fi device in it. Someone hacked into it and began listening to the communications in the employee staff room. Okay, the attack surface for um, cyber criminals is going to get a lot larger because of all of these internet devices. You can do Bitcoin mining on almost any of them, not efficiently, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so the, the cyber um, risks here are very, very huge. Data privacy and ownership is a big deal. And finally, and the biggest one which people are very concerned about is economic disruption. Those automated haul trucks in um, Suncor are just the beginning, just the beginning. Um, Google is already running autonomous trucks across Arizona. Uh, sorry, it's Amazon running autonomous trucks across Arizona because they can, and, and that's to provision their warehouses. So no jobs in warehouses, no jobs in, in, in uh, holding steering wheels. If you hold a steering wheel for a living today and you're 55, you're probably okay. If you're 45, doubtful. If you're 35, that job's gone. That job's gone. So huge economic disruption. We think Uber is a startling problem in Rome. We haven't seen anything yet. You know, I take a bunch of the uh, number of the U.S. southern United States, um, which is uh, Trump's heartland. Uh, many of those states feature um, white male workforces whose principal occupation is driving for a living, and they're armed. Okay, they all have guns, and this digital wave is going to take those jobs away. So life is going to get very exciting uh, south of the border. <laughs> choices. We have choices. Little scenario planning exercise, fun thing to do. Uh, you draw two lines on a, on a chart and put the extremes on either end. So imagine a digital world and versus an analog world. Imagine a world with greater globalization and greater stagflation. We have to choose which of our, these destinies we want to get to. We have to choose. Do we embrace globalization or do we stagflate? Do we block pi pipelines which give us access to global markets? That's a stagflation issue. That's a stagflation issue. Or do we embrace globalization? Trump and his tariffs uh, tearing up the TPP. Um, that's a stagflation play. Or do you want to be more, and then on the more digital and analog, where do we want to be on that world? Do we want to be um, a Singapore or Estonia, which are very digital, or do we want to stay more analog? And uh, my view is, um, where I would like this to be is, is in that digital globalization quadrant, that upper right. That looks like a pretty fun place to be. And I think a number of the trend lines that are out there are in motion where that's where we're headed. Um, and this generation, your generation, is the one that's going to see us uh, get there. That's it. If you're not excited now about the transition energy, I can't help you. <laughs> uh, and this is, would be a great time for um, Q&A, I think. Are we there? I think we're there. Yep, 6.30. Fire away. <coughs> Yeah, so with the plants, because um, I've designed and developed several of the larger plants around the world, um, billions of dollars. But what you're saying here is to get this digitalization in, we need to look, start looking at more micro refineries. 
um, but which you know, have a quicker turnover and adopt um, technologies in a quicker manner. Yeah. And then the play I would look at as, as an example would be uh, the, the, the option to, uh, say, build a $5 billion, 30,000 barrel a day oil sand SAG-D plant, or a shale play in, in, in a shale reserve. The shale is going to get the money. That's the, that's the where we're at now. You Zach? Alluded, you alluded to Canada being a bit of a laggard in uh, digital ad ad adaptation. What is your um, advice to convincing companies to embrace them, even though they may be the, the, the goal may be against their traditional economic model? Yeah, so um, very, very challenging to convince boards um, about this. The, unfortunately, I sit on the board of a blockchain company, by the way, and uh, 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 so I get a chance to circulate from time to time with other board members. And unfortunately, they're my age and they're not very digital. Uh, and the consequ the challenge is can exp kind to of get that that in the uh, that audience to embrace digital innovation means uh, you, there's a need to educate that group. Uh, that education takes a long time. It takes a long time. So my advice to boards, for instance, and management teams is uh, if you don't have an advisor on your board who understands digital, get one. Chevron has a Cisco executive on their board for exactly that reason. Exactly that reason. So that any time that board is making a decision or having a discussion about the investment they're going to make, the digital voice can be heard. Uh, what's, do you know what's going on like, in terms of funding? Like, uh, there was a LinkedIn post, and I, I subscribed to this uh, newsletter, and I would encourage everyone here to do the same, it's CB Insights. Hmm. And, but they're primarily picking up US data, so that's where I, and I you know, posted a an infographic on investment trends. Hmm. But yeah, it was, it's, it's US. And then I asked you and like some of the people I know interested in this space, and that like only then did I hear about the like artificial intelligence and blockchain or like, you know, it did. Those other investments, yeah. So, well, number one, like the. It's, Where, where's the money? Well, are we funding it? Number two, we have to tell the story because people, people don't know what's happening. So the, uh, the funding is very, so, so the, Alberta has had a 30 year run at putting its investment into pretty narrow fields of endeavor, yeah. right? Drill another hole. And uh, <laughs> so we, we have to swing the battleship, right? That's, yeah. That takes time, that takes yeah. time. And uh, so the universities have to produce the educated team, people who understand that. And uh, we have to then move the finance industry to say, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fund other things. And then you have to educate the businesses to say, well, I'm prepared to invest in this. And yeah, it, no, it yeah. takes time. It's, yeah, it's just uh, of, of the tech entrepreneurs I know here in Calgary, it's, it's yeah. a struggle. Like it's a struggle. My, my advice is to put blockchain after their name. And uh, <laughs> Did you see that story about that uh, iced tea outfit that put blockchain after the name and yeah. the stock price went up 20%? <laughs> it's true, put blockchain after your name. Yes? So, moving towards the digital globalized quadrant, what would you say is the advantage of having a policy and government help or hindrance or both in moving in that direction? Uh, so, on balance, the IEA dug into this, um, that exact question. Thank you for raising it. I didn't actually put that material here, but, uh, but I do have a view of this. Uh, there are six critical barriers to the adoption of digital. Um, uh, and two of those barriers are policy or government related. Number one, our institutions aren't set up for digital. How do you toll sunshine, mm -hmm. right? I know how to toll gas. I know how to toll um, oil. I don't know how to toll sunshine. Should I even toll sunshine? We put tax on gasoline and it paves our roads. Like the gas tax here and blah, 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 and we pave roads with it, right? Well, what happens if you're not buying a gasoline car anymore? Like, well, where is it? Who's going to pay for the roads? So our policy setting agenda and our policy environment is way behind on this, way behind. Our institutions are behind. We don't know how to fund it. We don't know how to finance it. We don't know how to toll it. We don't know how to approve it. Why did Calgary take two years to approve Uber? Right, why? It's crazy. So um, institutional reform is a critical, critical piece of the puzzle here. Yep. 
the regulators and all the rules that are in our economy are actually here to serve the needs and protect the incumbents. This is a big issue. If you are a novel innovator and you've got some creative technology, Uber, you're running headlong into an entrenched taxi industry and a regulatory system that's been set up to keep peace amongst taxi drivers, not to embrace digital change. So the regulatory frameworks that we live within have been set up to serve the needs of the incumbent. And they all have, they all have to change. Yes. I'm offended, by the way, but, but go ahead. We as professionals, do you have any advice for us who are working under the kind of people who are not ready to leave you know, a digital world um, that we can do kind of on a daily basis to have an impact? Uh, yeah, I have lots of ideas, and, and certainly doing this is a great one, is a great one. Um, I think creating a digital forum to share ideas about digitization uh, is another great one. Um, sharing your innovations that, that really work. Right, is another great one, uh, and 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 doing that within your own with your own community. Eventually, you'll be, you'll be heard. Uh, and, but uh, you know, I'm I'm probably the wrong guy around education. I have a podcast series. I have three Twitter accounts. I've written hundreds of blog articles. I'm not the right guy to look at to go. You're the model. I'm not the model. I'm 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 way further out than than my peer group. So I don't really, I'm not sure how I would say to you, engage with me like this and I can, and I can get that because I'm naturally technically curious and experimenter. So ask dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. So at the, uh, at the sidelines of this uh, workshop with the IEA, uh, they said uh, we will absolutely not hit the two-degree target. Um, when the reasons for that were uh, in their modeling uh, was that the rapid growth rate in renewables simply wasn't rapid enough. And it's a little hard to kind of grasp that. China installs three soccer fields of solar panels every hour around the clock. They put up one wind tower every hour around the clock, and it's just not fast enough. So their view was, until we start accelerating that, we can't, we can't go, we, we're not going to hit it. So that's, that's one of it. The other is, uh, you know, we have to rip out and uh, replace a lot of appliances. We've got to overhaul all these buildings that drive the demand. So there's a lot of investment here, right? If you guys aren't getting excited about this, someone has to figure out how to overhaul all these bloody buildings, you know, for us to, to survive. So the, the future's great if you're, in that, if you're interested in that sort of thing. That was their principal issue. Okay, so gonna... I think we have to stop there, right? <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> we will be here till late. I'm sticking around, so if you want to ask more questions, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. Perfect. Well, let's do a quick round of applause for Jeffrey. Uh, <laughs>